Good morning, everyone. Sorry to interrupt, because I know it's really wonderful to, to meet and greet each other and to catch up and to share a, a nice handshake, a hug, and some pleasant thoughts. But uh, we want to get out of here in, in time to beat the Baptist at all the restaurants, right? So we got to get... No, just kidding, just kidding. Good to get started this morning. Uh, a couple of announcements to get started off with today. After worship, we have uh, the Youth Committee Luncheon for all of you who are involved and in, are interested in being involved in the youth program. It has to do, of course, with uh, the children's worship program. It has to do with the summer camp and so many other things. And uh, did I cover that well enough, darling? Or, yes. Okay, all right, next slide, please. Okay, uh, I put a lot of stuff on here, and the reason being is, of course, the top left, the Tucker Young Festival Singers, our children's music program, will continue as always this Wednesday night on, uh, at 5 o'clock. But the reason that I put it here with the uh, other stuff, you see the picture there in the middle, and you see the girl with the mask on and the Valentine outfit, that's Ildiko right over here. So this past Tuesday, Networks had the sort of grand opening of their new facility over on Calvin Road. And Anne brought four of the singers from the Tucker Young Festival Singers. Most of them, of course, are in school and couldn't get off, but the others are homeschooled, and therefore they do all kinds of fun and exciting projects, including singing at networks. So the mayor of Tucker was there. Many of the dignitaries and important people of Tucker were there. And the reason I point that out is because when they sang a song that you may remember, You Are Welcome Here, is that the name of it, You Are Welcome Here? It brought a lot of tears, as you can imagine. And then the president of the Tucker Civic Association, Miss Honey Vandercreek, asked Anne, do you think that the Tucker Young Festival Singers would come and sing at the Tucker Civic Association's annual meeting next week? And so, guess what? The Tucker Young Festival Singers have been invited to sing this Tuesday night in this auditorium for the Tucker Civic Association's annual meeting. So that's obviously the one on the far right. Uh, very honored to be able to host that this year. And uh, so we will have that. Certainly if you are involved or want to be involved in the life of the city of Tucker, it's very well worth being here. The yearly membership for the Tucker Civic Association is only $35. And it goes to a lot of great work that happens here in Tucker, okay? Uh, next slide, please. The next morning is Ash Wednesday, so this week we begin Lent. That means you've got to get all of your sinning done on Tuesday. But do it before the Civic Association meeting, and then come to the, then on Wednesday morning, of course, we will have ashes. We will pull this table over here, have the lights low, some nice music playing. We will have the ashes and communion. Somewhere between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., you're invited to stop by to either apply the ashes yourself and to take of the communion yourself, or if you want, I will be on hand, Anne will be on hand, and we will be more than happy to uh, administer the ashes, pray with you over communion. So it's kind of a whatever you like, and, and it's going to be nice and respectful and quiet in here, so we invite you to that. Uh, next slide, please. We continue our Wednesday evening Bible study at 6 o'clock in the community room, also known as the Fisherman Classroom, down the hall. 6 o'clock, we have a short video from this series called Invitation to the Old Testament. It's about a 15-minute uh, video, and that's just, just the right length, because the rest of the time we spend talking about the issues that it raises, but also talking about issues that, uh, that arise in our discussion of the Exodus, or Abraham, and so forth. It also tied in really nicely with this sermon series that, that I've been doing this month. Okay, do we have another slide? Again, we continue to support networks, and on the back side of the bulletin, on the bottom right hand, you see that there's a list of items that they need, non-perishable items. I do believe that that list has been somewhat updated, because now that they have a bigger facility, and People who need assistance can go in with a shopping cart and pick out what they need as opposed to just getting a, a bag handed to them. So they can expand their repertoire a little bit. Uh, and, a, and as you know, in the Narthex, we have a place where we can deposit those items. Yes, ma'am. 
toiletry items included. Also, uh, as you know, Ann is a board member at Networks and does take those food items there every Wednesday or Friday. And I believe there's going to be some volunteer opportunities coming up. So if you want to volunteer at Networks, please see her about that. We continue, oh, say, you can leave that slide there, James, it's okay, but we continue to offer math tutoring at 9.30 to 11.45 on Sunday mornings. So if you know any kids that are struggling with math, we have just the person to help them, which is, of course, Kirk Lundy. Next slide, please. I think this is our last, advert. is that right? Uh, spring Cleaning Sunday, which is basically a month from today. We will worship, but we will wear t-shirts and blue jeans, clothes that we don't mind getting dirty. We will follow worship with, with lunch, and after lunch, we have lots of big projects we're going to do to clean up, to organize, and I believe we're going to even order a dumpster because we have some junk that needs to go out. How about that? So please make plans. If you don't have a church t-shirt, we have some, a variety of some left over. Hopefully, if we have your size, we can, we can hook you up with a church t-shirt. All right, uh, let me end the announcements with that, but before I turn it over to our worship leader, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to the young man in the sound booth back there, James Butler. Today is officially James Butler's last service with us as a sound technical engineer, and it's be not because he hates us, but because he got a job at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And he's going to be like a sound wizard guru uh, there, and that's uh, pretty much a full-time job. But that doesn't mean we won't see him in the future. I do believe that James will be around. It's just that uh, maybe fewer and more far between. But anyway, James, we all appreciate what you've done for us. <laughs> Wish you the best. And also, maybe you can work a little magic with the Falcons. We don't know. Okay. On that note, let's uh, begin our time of worship. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to First Christian Church of Atlanta. It's so good to see everybody. I know there may be some visitors, and you're especially welcome. And our people that may be watching online, we're glad that you're with us, in, at least in spirit. Um, I just had a little thought for the day. Tomorrow being President's Day, George Washington may have been the one that never told a lie, but he was relatively new to politics. <laughs> now, would you stand as you're able for our opening hymn, number 625, Precious Name, verses 1 and 2. Be seated. If this crazy weather has taught us anything, it is that 
thinking that we're out of the woods of flu season or COVID or anything else is probably a little bit premature. Uh, I think we got down below freezing last night. It's going to get up to springtime temperatures today, and who knows what it's going to be like. Life is a little bit unpredictable, kind of like the weather. But what is sure and firm is the God upon whom we call in our time of need. So would you join me now as we enter into our time of prayer? I invite you to pray along with me. And when I say the words, hear us as we pray from the silence of our hearts, that'll be a time in which I'll pause and give you a moment to also lift up to the Lord your, your joys, your fears, your cares, and your concerns. Let us as the body of Christ now go before the Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, as we gather together, we praise you for this day and your purpose for it. We ask you to reset our agendas as we sit in your presence, recalibrate our intentions and refocus our hearts. Our plans do not always reflect your will for our lives, so redirect them to reflect your will. Help us to understand that we don't always need full clarity to walk the unique path that you lay out before us. Lift our eyes to seek you first today. Shift our perspective to seek your face above all else. In every situation that we ponder, awaken us to the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Give us renewed strength and godly courage to obey you. Forgive us for striving beyond our means with worry and often trying to force results. Only you know what lies ahead. You are the good father, just and righteous. Though our circumstances will be unfair from time to time in this life, You are always our unwavering protector and shield. Renew our hearts as we seek you more than anything else. And in this hour of worship, hear us as we each pray from the silence of our hearts. And now, hear us as we join heart, mind, and voice in the prayer that Jesus teaches us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the time for our offering, a key component of our stewardship and worship, enabling us to fulfill the missions God has for us here. Would the deacons please come forward?
you, God, you have blessed us with such love and goodness. We offer these gifts to you with thankful hearts and in joyful praise. May these offerings extend the work of your kingdom in our church and this community. Amen. You may be seated. Come to the time of the Lord's Supper and a, a part of our worship service that we observe every single week. and We consider it to be the pinnacle of worship. That's hard to say as a preacher because you want to think that the sermon is the best thing ever, but of course, we, we believe that the most important thing is the sacrament, and I was being a little funny there. But we also want you to know and understand that if you are worshiping with us for the first time, we invite you to participate in the Lord's Supper. As a denomination, the Disciples of Christ is founded upon the idea that all people are welcome at God's table. So whoever you are, if you feel inclined, if you desire to come and to partake, we invite you. And we do this in two ways, uh, because of COVID and because of uh, the way the, the practice has changed over the years. Our elders here will pray over the bread and the cup here in just a minute. And after the prayer, they will come down and they have gloves that they will put on and they will hand out a, a piece of bread and an individual cup to whoever desires it. We also have here at this table the self-serve, hermetically sealed, hygienically uh, COVID-friendly or whatever you want to call it, chalices that have the bread on one side and a little peel-off tab and the cup on the other side with also a peel-off tab. You are welcome to come and to partake of either one. I'd like to uh, repeat a sermon, a uh, communion meditation that I wrote many years ago, and uh, the former school teacher and me uh, like to focus here on the pronouns that we observe in the Lord's Supper. So this may be our congregation, but this is his table. There are legal documents in a safe deposit box in a bank that has some of your names on it, on them, but this is his table. Does that make sense? I mean, we all have business in relation to the, but okay, good, thank you. We meet about this table, but it is his table. All are welcome at this table, and it is not for us to decide who can or cannot approach it. On the night in which he was betrayed, Christ took the bread and blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, drink from it, all of you, for it is the new covenant in my body blood. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we partake of it, we proclaim the Lord's death until his return. Christ invites us all to his table so that we can share it. Let us pray. I, for the words of institution, for I have received of the Lord what I have also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup also, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Bless this moment as we come to this celebration to break and eat this bread in remembrance of the death of your son on the cross. With grace and mercy, encourage us to still our hearts and clear our minds. And in the same way as we take this cup, representing your blood that was shed for us, 
so that we all can be free from the power and penalty of sin. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Now all are invited to come. Our scripture today is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 through 32. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhibit the whole earth and be marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, 
But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. The word of God for you, the people of God. I understand that the uh, piano part is no cakewalk either. Uh, the, the young people are now dismissed for children's worship, kids' church. Lucky you, you dodged a bullet. So today I will deliver the last uh, message in this series of uh, basically what are the Jewish backgrounds of the New Testament, which I have this time around called from tent dwellers to tent makers, how ancient Hebrews became Jews and Christians. And I will judge by the feedback that I received that has been very well uh, received, the, the series itself, and I really appreciate that. Uh, this is a series that obviously grew out of my own struggle or uh, search to understand the Bible, understand religion, understand how all those things fit together, 
how we became Christians out of what uh, basically is the foundations of Judaism and so forth. Uh, obviously, uh, I, don't, I think I told you this before, but many, many years ago when I went to Bible college and I was in my first year of Bible college, I was, what, 19 years old. <laughs> and I realized I'm taking all these classes on doctrine. I know that I want to be a preacher and all this kind of stuff. Maybe I should just read the Bible. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Maybe that makes sense. I don't know. And so, uh, but every one of you and all of us, should I say, who have attempted to read the Bible don't always find it self-explanatory or easy to follow. And then in the Old Testament, we read about Hebrews and Israelites and Samaritans and Jews. And then we don't read about Christians until the New Testament and so forth. And then in the New Testament, we meet characters like Pharisees and Sadducees and Zealots and so forth. And so it was been, it's been kind of a quest. And so I, obviously I went from Bible college, had a bit of a break, then I went to seminary. And during the, my time in seminary, I also got involved in the Department of Jewish Studies. So once I finished my seminary degree, I <laughs> re-enlisted, shall we say, and took another round and earned a second master's degree in Jewish Studies. So a lot of what I have to share with you then is not simply, I found a cool book and I'm re reproducing it for you. Instead, this is a quest. I started teaching this series 10 years ago, the first time at Sandy Springs Christian Church. I've taught it down in Griffin. I've taught it uh, in school where I was an AP world history teacher for uh, 20 years. I've taught it here twice on a Wednesday night. And I've actually had two different Jewish women who attended uh, this and told me each, I really appreciated it. I thought you were respectful of my faith and I learned something. So I really appreciate that. One of them, of course, was Lois Ritchie. And as we say in the Jewish tradition, may her memory be a blessing. Sorry that we lost her back in November. And one of the key ingredients to this study, in my opinion, comes from Krista Stendhal, who was the uh, head of the Church of, of Sweden years ago, also at one time the dean of Harvard Divinity School, and he had those three rules for uh, religious understanding, and I'd like to share them with you one last time. When trying to understand another religion, you should ask the adherents of that religion and not its enemies. Secondly, don't compare your best to their worst. And finally, leave room for holy envy. And I certainly hope that this discussion has definitely created a, a little bit of holy envy. Uh, one of the first, one of the things I usually try to do with this series is, is, nail, uh, is kind of attack that idea that people have that Pharisees are always bad, you know, and, and some of the other things, understanding. And so maybe over time we have come to see things differently and learn to appreciate nuances and aspects of the Jewish faith out of which the Christian faith has grown. Last week was my favorite. It was, I thought we had a rather lively discussion of the Apostle Paul. And I pointed out several very interesting things that some people had never known. One of them is that the word Christian never occurs in any of Paul's writings. Keep in mind, that there are 27 books and letters in the New Testament, 14 of which, or 13 of which, are associated with the Apostle Paul. Never does the word Christian occur in any of those writings, ever. So that was a thing that was really worth pointing out. However, the word Christian does occur in the Bible, how many times? Three times, all right, Margaret remembered. Only three times in the New Testament do we see the word Christian, and two of them are associated with Paul. Okay, One of them is when Barnabas finds him and brings him to Antioch, and the, the sort of the tagline there says, and the, Christ, the disciples were first known as Christians at Antioch. And another one, Paul is on trial. He's headed towards Rome, and he's uh, on trial, and King Agrippa asks him or says to him, Almost persuaded, right? Like that old gospel hymn from back in the day. You've almost persuaded me to be a Christian. But Acts was not written by Paul. So just keep that in mind. It, it, whatever that means, it kind of feeds into the other point that I wanted to make. 
And this is a point that, that needs to be made for a lot of reasons. And that is that our understanding of Paul needs to change a little bit. That Paul, according to my argument last week, I'll just give it to you this week, and if you don't follow it, go back and look at the manuscript or the video from last week, please. That Paul did not see himself as a man who had given up his religion for another religion. Paul did not see himself as having been raised a Jew and then converted to Christianity. Paul saw himself as a faithful Jewish man who came to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Paul was a man who continued to be a Jew, who continued to believe in Jesus, but took the message of the gospel outside of the Jewish world into the Gentile world because he believed the message of Christ was universal. What he did not believe was universal was circumcision and kosher eating and many of the other things that are specifically Jewish. And if you read Acts 15, you, and if you read Paul's letter to the Galatians, you'll see that not everybody agreed with him in that time, and that he had a fight on his hands. And he, goes, he responds to that, are they Hebrews? So am I, circumcised on the eighth day, born of the tribe of Benjamin, uh, you know, uh, raised, born to Pharisees and a Pharisee myself, and as to the law, blameless. Paul had his pedigree, and he didn't renounce it. He did not repudiate his, his Jewishness, but what he did was say, the message of the gospel is for all people. The Jewish, specifically Jewish parts, are for the Jewish people. God made a covenant with the Jewish people. And this is, again, an important point. Why would we believe that God made a covenant with the Jewish people in the Old Testament in, the, in which God says, this is an eternal covenant which shall not be broken, and then turn around and say, oh, I didn't mean that. Let's go this new direction. So I think that's, that's, to me, that's all very, very important way to refocus our understanding of Paul, which means we have to go back 500 years to the Protestant Reformation and see how Martin Luther, with his own issues against the Catholic Church and with the Jewish people, how his particular take on things have influenced so much New Testament scholarship over the last 500 years. All that being said, the Apostle Paul had a distinctly Christian message. And when we read Paul's letters, particularly Romans, we see that Paul had a distinctly Christian message, and here is sort of a bullet list of what those elements were, okay? So here we go. The belief in Jesus as the Messiah, the Lord, and the Son of God. You can't read Paul and not get that. Number two, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit as the divine dynamic of this new life. You can't read Paul without reading about the Holy Spirit. Number three, the doctrine of the church as the new Israel. Number four, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. We get our best material on that from Paul. Number five, the, quote, words of the Lord, which he quotes. And Paul does quote Jesus in his letters. And as I pointed out last week, he even quotes Jesus, uh, quotes something from Jesus that we don't read in the Gospels. The saying that the Lord loves a cheerful giver is quoted by Paul, but not at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? The, number six, the belief in Christ's return. And finally, the inauguration of this new age in the ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So what we think of as a Christian message, all of that is found in Paul's writings. Paul preached that Gentiles, that is people who were not ethnically or religiously Jews, did not have to become Jews in order to follow Jesus. In other words, for Paul, the coming of the Messiah marked the time when an ethnic religion, Judaism, or tribal religion, Judaism, was transformed into a universal religion. That is, a religion that is for all people. It's not that Paul had to leave the faith of his childhood in order to believe in Jesus. Rather, the point is that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah and Son of God, is for all people. The Torah, 
The covenant is for the Jews, but salvation is for all. So in today's message, we are going to look at an example of Paul's preaching then to a non-Jewish audience. Acts chapter 17, a very uh, popular passage in the book of Acts. And it also raises some pretty interesting questions for us as we look at it. Uh, For one thing, there are the differences in belief systems, right? So Paul had clearly a biblical and Jewish worldview. Okay? Does that make sense? His audience did not. He was in Athens, Greece. He was in pagan territory. So was it right for Paul to challenge their notions of God? And if so, why? How did Paul frame his arguments? How, for instance, did his Jewish worldview inform his arguments about who God is or or what God is? or how God should be approached? And how did he borrow from the Greek philosophical tradition to support that Jewish worldview? Or to put it differently, how did he modify his Jewish vocabulary to fit a Greek one? Am I making sense so far? Doing good? So let us also finally ask ourselves about how we might approach a similar situation in our own day. So, to begin answering these questions, it is important for us to recognize where Paul was when he delivered this message. Okay? So, Acts 17, 22 tells us, and Peggy did a super job. She was worried about saying Areopagus, right? She did it. She got it. And uh, that everybody who's a worship leader, by the way, they just get really concerned, and I'm going to give them a passage that's got, like, lots of biblical names in it, right? Like, like in... I, somebody's going to get the passage in Isaiah where you have Meher Shalal Hashbaz, and you're going to have to read it like five times. It's going to be fun. But you did it. He was at the Areopagus in Athens, Greece. Okay? So this is a meeting place in ancient Greece where it councils tried cases. Sometimes they tried legal cases, political issues, and sometimes they tried religious issues. And as you know, whether you've taken an introductory course in philosophy or not, what is Athens Athens famous for? It's not exactly right to say the home or the origin of philosophy, but it is definitely like Nashville is to country music, right? Athens is to classical philosophy. Athens is the place where Socrates lived and taught. It is where Plato, his, his teacher, his student, excuse me, his, his student Plato founded an academy that lasted for over 900 years. And where Plato's uh, student Aristotle founded an academy that lasted uh, almost as long. Ancient Greece is to classical philosophy what Nashville is to country music. You know, you got Bakersfield, you got other places, but Nashville is the place, right? You got the Grand Ole Opry, Branson, Missouri, but you got the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, okay? Many other schools of thought were also deeply embedded in Athens, okay? It's like the university town par excellence in his day. You have, of course, mentioned in our text the Stoics and the Epicureans. So you have all these people with all these ideas, and Paul is out preaching, and they're like, you're saying some weird stuff. We want to hear more, and so they invite him to this Areopagus. So let me back up uh, and add a few more verses to our reading for today. Acts chapter 17, verses 18 through 21. And here we go. Some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this pretentious babbler have to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Does that set the stage for us a little bit? Okay, Paul, here's Paul, this rabbi, Pharisee actually, 
believer in Jesus, proclaiming a very Jewish, biblical understanding of, of God and, and, and everything else. And here we have thrown him into the lion's den of the classical home of philosophy. So at first we can say that Paul's message piqued their curiosity, right? The curiosity of a city that was already very curious about many, many things. And what a prestigious audience this is for Paul to be addressing. His message to some people sounded like nonsense. Well, that's not surprising. And to others, it sounded like an exotic foreign Eastern religion. But the author of Acts, who is recording this event for us, wants us to see Paul's presentation of the gospel as actually something very well reasoned, very well argued, and very well executed about a universal God and a universal message. And what is very interesting to me about this message is that Paul presented this very Jewish, biblical worldview without ever quoting Scripture. Right? But what does he quote from? Pagan Greek poets. In verses 22 to 23, Paul begins by observing to them, to them their spirituality, the spirituality of Athenian culture. And I like the fact that the translation here, the New Revised Standard Version, uses the word spiritual because I think it, it um, identifies an important theme that is still very relevant to us today. People are spiritual. To be human is to be spiritual. But spirituality can take any form. I mean, you can legitimately feel spiritual in a concert. You can feel legitimately spiritual on a hike through the woods and the mountain. There's nothing wrong with it. You can feel legitimately spiritual. Uh, I know that there are people who do yoga and pray. I mean, there's just all kinds of ways to be spiritual. There's no question about that. And here, these people, they, their spirituality is, is, is directed in many different ways. But notice the indication of a shrine to an unknown God. I think that's very suggestive. Did this imply that the creators of this shrine were just trying to hedge their bets? You know, make sure they cover all the bases? Now, I heard a rumor, and I tried to follow it up this week, and I found out that it was false. But I heard a rumor years ago that when John Wayne was on his deathbed, that he converted to every religion just to make sure he got the right one. Now, I don't think that's true. That may be the truth. But uh, all of my research indicates that he uh, affirms Catholicism around his death. But, uh, but I don't know. But I'm sure there are people. I, I remember a story somebody told that he was in an Asian country, and he asked, met a guy who said, I'm Presbyterian and Buddhist and something else, and I just want to make sure I cover all the bases. So that's the question here. Is, is this shrine to an unknown God just simply trying to cover all the bases, make sure that uh, at least we can have plausible deniability, you know? Uh, well, I, you know, we weren't really sure, so we just, you know, made this generic. Or does a shrine to the unknown God indicate that they had a suspicion that all of their theology was inadequate? That all of the things that they thought about God just didn't add up to common sense or to reason. Maybe they thought that the real God has to be something better than Zeus and Hera and Heracles, which, by the way, Heracles is the Greek version of Hercules, right? And, and so, forth, so forth. In our own day, we know people that are dissatisfied with the way God is presented by religion in our own world. Am I right? Some people talk about the God beyond God. In other words, they're trying to say that if there's a God, it's probably more than what you guys are talking about. Some people talk about ultimate meaning to indicate that our understanding of God is limited. And some of you may have heard of a book that was written many years ago called Your God is Too Small by J.B. Phillips. And actually with this slide here, what I've done is I've created a, sort of a spectrum because on the one end, J.B. Phillips was a, was a minister. He, he believed in God. 
but he, his book is all about the sort of idolatrous ways that Christians talk about God that are self-serving and, shall we say, insulting to God. On the other hand, we have Carl Sagan, uh, who uh, I don't think he was an atheist. I'm not sure that he was, but I'm pretty sure he was an agnostic. And he said, your God is too small for my universe. And I think that there is some room in there to appreciate what Carl Sagan is, was saying. And that is the idea that sometimes we present God that is too limited, limited by our culture, limited by our own self-understanding, or maybe even limited by our own preferences. The picture of God that Paul presents kind of speaks to all of these different ideas, and, and that is whether they're just hedging their bets or whether they think that God, the ultimate reality has to be something more than what they've been told. On the one hand, to the question of a general appeal to an unknown source, Paul responded in verse 23, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So he's going to not let them off the hook that way. So on the one hand, this God can be known, according to Paul. However, notice that what he declares about God is totally unfamiliar to the Greek mindset. This God is not presented with a name or a gender or a human-like personality or even a physical description. Because if you think about it, the Greek gods, the Roman gods, they're just like superheroes, right? They're, they're humans. They have, you know, uh, vices. They have inadequacies. They have weaknesses. But they're just stronger in, in some ways than humans, in fact, they don't die, if I remember correctly. Paul presents instead a very Jewish presentation of God in several ways. So first of all, his argument begins with God as creator and ends with God as judge. In verse 24, he says, The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth. So there you have creator. And then in verse 31, he states that God has fixed a day on which he will judge the righteous. Sorry, I lost my spot. Uh, he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness. Even without quoting from the Old Testament scriptures, Paul is speaking as an Old Testament prophet. He has here expressed a very prophetic idea from the Old Testament. Second, his presentation is also prophetic because it attacks idolatry. And remember, as we read through the Old Testament, particularly starting with the Exodus and going all the way through to the Babylonian captivity, what do we see? The prophets are constantly having to do what? Uh, uh, castigate them for falling into the worship of idols. There was a time in the Old Testament when the Israelites, the Samaritans, and the Jews struggled with idolatry. And it was the prophets who were constantly provoking them, confronting them with this wrong thinking. By Paul's day, that was all gone. After the Babylonian exile, idolatry is no longer a problem with the Jewish people. And what happened with the Babylonian captivity was not only that somehow that experience purged them of idolatry, but it also purged them of this idea that the God that they worshiped was limited to their homeland. That if they were in Babylon, if they were in Greece, if they were in Africa, if they were in North America in our day, that God is everywhere and God is universal. Which means that ultimately the message of the prophets was very successful. God is bigger than our own tribal understanding of who God is. And now you see what's happening with Paul? He's going to the Greeks, to the, the, the epicenter of intellect, and saying, your God is too small. During medieval times, Islamic and Jewish and Christian theologians formulated 
a kind of theology which we call, and we'll use a $10 word for you. Ready for this? Apophatic theology. Now, in plain English, negative theology. What is negative theology? Sounds bad, but it's not. The purpose of apophatic or negative theology was to avoid saying the wrong thing about God. Okay? So, you know, just like the, the Ten Commandments say, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain, it is important when we do theology, when we say God is this and God is that, we, it, is, it is important for us not to misrepresent God. And sometimes by the way we talk about God, we may be giving up the physical statue idols, but may be creating mental idols of a God that we would prefer to serve. So this negative theology was created so that what can happen is instead of saying what God is, you say what God isn't. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, as an example, um, since I went off script, I have to go back and, and reposition myself here. Rather than saying that God is this or that, they developed a safer method of describing what God isn't. So, for instance, they might say, God is not a man. Okay? Now, that is not to pigeonhole God, but it definitely cre t teaches us something that's true. It's a true statement that does not risk an error. Interestingly, this approach kind of grew with the synthesis of biblical theology and Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. That's where medieval philosophy comes in. Now, I'm going to be done with medieval philosophy and theology just in a minute. But the reason that, that they adopted this philosophy from Plato and Aristotle is because Plato and Aristotle's philosophies pointed to a higher reality than the Greek myths that had been pictured by the Olympian gods, you see. And by Paul's day, many Greek thinkers including the people that he was addressing here at the Areopagus, they had rejected the concept of the gods that the Greek myths had promoted. Now, to us today, they make for great stories, right? They make for interesting movies. But certainly, we find their concept of God to be inadequate. In fact, there in Athens, Greece, where Paul was speaking and promoting the gospel, there was even a group of people called skeptics, and perhaps those are the people that are being addressed with the shrine to an unknown God. It, is, it can mean that a person is cautious so as to avoid speaking too lightly about ultimate reality. Sometimes they're atheists, but sometimes they're just simply agnostics. See, here in the book of Acts, chapter 17, we see that Paul is 800 years ahead of his time. That's what I'm saying. Paul it uses a negative theology approach in verses 24 and 25. So let's take a look at this. The God who made the world and everything in it, that's a positive statement. He who is Lord of heaven and earth, that's a positive statement. Now let's look at the negative side. Does not live in shrines made by human hands. That's not the right quote, is it? Go back one. There we go. Does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands. You see that? What God isn't. God isn't served in a shrine. God isn't served by human hands. That implies what? God is bigger. God is more than what you have conceived. As though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. The picture of God presented in these verses are of a pre-existing and transcendent being a God who existed before the world existed, a God who created all that is, and a God that is above and beyond it. But aside from that, Paul is also careful to avoid making God seem too human, right? If God made the world and everything in it, God is before it, he is above it. God is not a glorified human being, he is not a superhero, and he is not like the Greek or Roman gods. But God is not just far away far above and beyond the Greek notion of divinity, the biblical notion of God says that God is also very near. The last phrase in verse 25 that we just read leads right into this thought. 
He himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all people. Does that sound like Adam and Eve, or does that sound like creation? From one ancestor he made all peoples to inhabit the whole earth and allotted times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so they, they would search for God and perhaps fumble about for him and find him. Though indeed he is not far from each of us, now comes the quote from the pagan Greek poets. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. This, too, is a very Jewish understanding of God. This is the God of Exodus, who saw the suffering of his people and sent Moses to deliver them. Of course, it wasn't too many days later that he threatened to destroy them all because they created an idol, right? The golden calf. (laughs) So, and again, this was a hard lesson for the Jewish people to learn, but by the Babylonian captivity, they seem to have got that message. Now it was time for the rest of humanity to shed idolatry. While Paul presented this Jewish understanding of God, he used that pagan Greek poet to to support his claim. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. So just as Paul launched into his presentation of the gospel, by talking about how prevalent their spiritual attitude was. He also supported his arguments with a quote from their own thinkers to demonstrate that deep in, excuse me, the deep in the human heart, it is possible to see beyond idolatry to a more transcendent God. Does that make sense? That even in a pagan, even in our own limited human understanding of what God is, it is possible to see that there is something more to God than what we can comprehend. So what does all this mean? For Paul's message, it means that humans are responsible. Again, just to pick up the last part of our text today, verses 29 through 31, quote, since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. Okay, give up idolatry. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, he now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Who's he talking about? Right. So in this last section of our passage... Paul's Jewish message becomes a bit more noticeably Christian, doesn't it? Okay? The Greek notion of of being God's offspring is related to the biblical doctrine that God created humans in God's own image. Therefore, we should not think of God or of humans as resembling statues of wood or stone or of animals, you know, things like that. Actually, that's dehumanizing to us as well as to God. And with the proclamation of the gospel, humans are responsible before God. God will judge the world by righteousness, by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This was the issue, right, that got him to the Areopagus in the first place. What are you talking about? Somebody rose from the dead. In addition to just pointing out how Jewish this message is, I have also tried to demonstrate the way Paul adapted it for the Greek mindset. The message of monotheism is still there, one God. The message of the Messiah with his death, burial, and resurrection is there. And the message of the call to repentance is there. But now it is being presented to a larger audience in a language that they can relate to. In many ways, this is a significant turning point in church history. By this I mean that the mission to the Gentiles greatly altered the presentation of the gospel. Let me say that again. The mission to the Gentiles 
greatly altered the presentation of the gospel. Not the message of the gospel. You hear what I'm saying? Not the message of the gospel, but the presentation. Because you're speaking to people who don't have that, that biblical worldview in their background. You have to start with where they are. And I would also argue, this is another sermon for another day, that whereas in a Jewish context, it makes a lot more sense to talk about Jesus as the Messiah. Can you see how in a Greek and Roman context, it's very important to talk about Jesus is the Son of God? Especially when they have, you know, you know, Zeus has got lots of children, right? And so forth. Once you remove the... Um, ethnic or tribal elements from the gospel message, such as circumcision, kosher eating, and so forth. You are proclaiming a very universal message of salvation. It's still God is one, you know, idols are wrong, you know, all this kind of stuff. The message is still there, but the, the, the specifically Jewish elements are not there, but the universal elements are there. And if we were to follow church history from this point on, we would see how the gospel's engagement with each new culture meant confronting new issues. So those of you who know church history, the, the, the uh, Council of Nicene, uh, the Nicene Creed, many of you learned the Nicene Creed, right? Or the Apostles' Creed or the, one of those, I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth and all that. Those creeds came about when the gospel left the homeland and went out into the Greek world. And all of a sudden, well, you're saying God is this and God is that. We have to understand. And so these creeds are born in order to explain and to solidify the teaching of the church. And engagement with new cultures means new, new uh, problems and new... By the way, we wouldn't have Christmas trees up here in December without the engagement of other cultures, right? Because where does that come from? Not from the Bible, right? <laughs> Okay, and that's what I like being about being a minister in the Disciples of Christ, our denomination. We value diversity. We model inclusion. But at the end of the day, our goal is to be as faithful as possible to the gospel, the message as presented simply in the New Testament. That is the message that we invite everyone to, to receive. Um, I was just speaking this week, and we don't have a sales pitch, we don't have an arm twist, but at the same time, we always wanna make it possible for anyone who desires to join the church to know what that means. And that means that uh, if, if you have a desire to join the church, what, are, what does that mean? So I have a slide, if you don't mind, James. Would you put that up there? What does it mean to join the church? I can see that the, the beard is coming out now. There we go. The church is the body of Christ and refers to all believers in all places who followed in all times who followed Jesus. If you are a believer, you already belong to Christ. You belong to the church, capital C. So whenever we talk about membership or whatever, we're not talking about the church, we're talking about the congregation, right? So we invite you to become part of the local congregation. Are we the only church in town? No, but we are a church that desires, we are a congregation that desires to make a difference, and that's what we mean. So uh, I just wanted to, to sort of explain it one more time and invite everyone to stand as we sing our closing hymn, which is, Lord, I want to be a Christian. That invitation is there for all who will receive it. And as we sing.
pray that today's worship has been a blessing to you. It's been uplifting and meaningful. And so let us go with the following words. Go forth into the world in peace and dedicated to the service of God. Let us hold fast to that which is good. Render no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the needy and the afflicted and honor all people. Let us love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of his spirit. And may God's blessing be upon us and remain with us always. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.